Uh, well, welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. and I am an Episcopal priest living here in the Diocese of Texas. I'm also in long-term recovery coming up on 48 years and um, have become a bit of a student on the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, especially as it emerged from its origins within the Oxford group. And I guess the particular interest that I have had is when I kind of fell into this uh, discovery of two-way prayer, of uh, doing a form of meditation where you're actively listening for God's voice. And um, I hope you'll visit our website. It's by the same name, Two Way Prayer, and drop us a line if you have any questions or wants more information, you can reach me at twowayprayer at gmail.com. We're continuing our series now, uh, I think this is number six, uh, on the subject of psychic change. And, uh, you know, we've been, we've been examining some of the works of uh, Professor William James, Varieties of Religious Experience, how important that was in the beginnings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Bill Wilson had his uh, psychic experience in Towns Hospital, thought he was going crazy, but then they gave him this book and said, well, maybe you're not as crazy as you thought. <laughs> maybe there's something that's really happening uh, in this. So, so uh, Professor James has had a tremendous influence on, on the history of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And now there is another professor, also by the name of William, uh, and his name is Professor William Miller. And he is the author of a wonderful book. It's called Quantum Change. I don't know if you can see that there. And um, it's uh, probably one of the best studies that has been done in the area of well, where spirituality and psychology meet uh, and taking it very seriously. So that's uh, Professor uh, uh, Miller has a uh, extensive background. He is, um, uh, well, he, he got his PhD. I'm gonna read a little bit of his, his uh, vitae here. His PhD from the University of Oregon. Uh, taught and did research for many years at the University of New Mexico. He was there from 1976 through 2006. And then he retired as Emeritus Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, the professor is probably best known for his pioneering work in the development of motivational interviewing. And that has just had a tremendous impact on, uh, on many uh, parts of the treatment field, not only alcoholism and addiction, but uh, in, in, uh, in, in general practice as well. But Professor Miller also brings uh, a, a great interest in the field of addiction. And uh, he got into it early in his career. And um, Professor, I wanna welcome you to the podcast and I, I so appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank so, you. I wonder if you could begin by telling us just a little bit about uh, uh, how this book of yours came about. Uh, I have a quote from you. You said this, in my 35 years of research, this was the most fun I ever had with a study and, <laughs> and the most uplifting. Uh, something about working with alcoholics that we just either have fun or, or let's just go get drunk. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us about it. Well, I, I've greatly enjoyed my work with addictions also and stayed with that my whole career just because the outcomes are so good. But this one study just stands out for me. I, I kind of privately think it's the most important piece of work I did in my career, but I haven't persuaded very many people of that. But I, I got interested in the Ebenezer Scrooge kind of change. I mean, we, we love that Dickens story, of course, or it's it's a wonderful life where something happens that changes the person permanently. But I got interested in whether that happens in real life. Uh, my daughter had such an experience that was, that was quite striking. And I went off on sabbatical leave to Australia and found a group of colleagues who were interested both in psychology and spirituality. And we just began talking about if, if you were to try to study this, how would you do that? And the last psychologist I could find who really had studied and written about it was William James uh, a, a century ago, now more than a century ago. 
Um, we decided that a study would simply be descriptive. I mean, you, you can't very well uh, randomly assign people to have such a change. Uh, and it's, you, you can't put people into imaging machines and wait for them to have one. Uh, uh, and so it, it's going to be retrospective. So you're going to find people who have had such an experience and have them describe it. Uh, and that's, that's uh, exactly what James was doing. Mm -hmm. Some theologians like James Loder have been interested in this phenomenon over time, but not many psychologists. There, there are a few case studies here and there of these sudden unexplained uh, changes. One, one psychologist called it an exorcism, even though it was not an exorcism, but uh, it was a very rapid change. <clears throat> the nature of them is that they, they're highly memorable. So people have a, a very clear memory of, of when this happened, long after it happened. Um, they're, they're hard to describe. People have a hard time finding the words to explain it. They're noetic in, the, mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, and they produce a permanent change. So unlike people that I've uh, worked with in addictions, or at least most people, where they're trying to hang on with white knuckles and not go back to where they were before, people with a quantum change know they have gone through a one-way door. Bill W. talks about that with his own experience, that, that he knew he was free. Um, now that's an unusual experience. And these experiences themselves often are quite unusual. We found that people don't talk about them very often uh, and if they do tell someone, often people look at them kind of strange because the mm -hmm. stories can sound sort of crazy. We read some of them to a psychiatrist who didn't know what we were reading. Uh, and, uh, and he said, this person should be in the hospital right now. You know? uh, so they're usually misunderstood as pathology. Um, and I think these are much more common than we ever imagined. Yes. And... Uh... James talks about two varieties, and, and you mentioned this in your book as well, you have the educational variety and the, the sudden dramatic ones. Your interest was primarily in the, in the second, but you, you, you advertised in the Albuquerque newspaper, as I recall, and that's how, how, how people came forward. You interviewed them at some length and um, found some very different experiences, but some things that were common to them as well. That's of, right. Uh, they were in pain. There was some turmoil going on. Some of them were in prayer when it happened. Is that mm -hmm. correct? About one third of them were praying at the time that it happened. Yeah. And that was Bill W. Wilson's case, actually. Sorry? Wilson was doing that in the hospital. Yes. God, if there is a God. Yeah, that's right. If, <laughs> if, and that, that is, some of the people were praying that prayer that, God, if you're out there, this would be a good time. <laughs> so, I've never and, been this low. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So prayer was a was I think the most common thing that people were doing. It was still only about a third of people. Maybe half of the people were in terrible distress. They were, they were at the end of the rope, and then the rope broke. You know that kind of, of situation, which was Bill W's experience as well. Yeah. But interestingly, the, a substantial proportion of people were just going about their lives, just doing their, their ordinary daily life like Ebenezer Scrooge was, just going home from work. Um, some of them were just, just sitting in the living room. One, one woman was cleaning a toilet. Another was sitting on a toilet when it, when it happened. Uh -huh. A man was just walking past his fireplace. So it, in the ordinariness of life, these also happened. And unsolicited, unexpected. What is it that happens? What, 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 when you try to get inside the event, what, what, what did you encounter there that, that, that they were able to put into words? Yeah, uh, the, putting into words was a challenge. So that was, that was a commonality. They, these folks knew that something unusual was happening to them, uh, something out of the ordinary. Uh, so it didn't it didn't feel like something that they had experienced elsewhere. Um, often they have a discrete beginning. Uh, you, you know that something unusual is happening. 
they last sometimes just for minutes or for a few hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're not usually very long experiences, um, but, but highly memorable. Yes. The, it's an experience. No one had the experience of I'm doing this myself. Uh, everyone. Which, which brings <laughs> in the, the human ego. Mm -hmm. It's like the ego is temporarily suspended. It's now yes. observing and yes. present, but not in charge. Yes. Yeah, they knew they were not in charge of this. Yeah. 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 It's very good for us alcoholics. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, for all of us as human beings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we we th thought we observed two types. Yeah. One type was a classic mystical experience. So the the... William James' description of, of mystical experiences, of, of having an, a noetic experience that has a kind of beginning and an end uh, that, you're, that you're not in charge of, and uh, it's quite unusual, mm. uh, and, and very commonly a sense of unity or oneness with all of humankind or all of creation, all of the universe even. So the, those are common in mystical experience, but these mystical experiences produce permanent change, which most mystical experiences don't. The other kind we call the insight type. And for these folks, there, there weren't the common elements of a mystical experience, but they had the experience of a revelation of something, aha, uh -huh, you know, seeing something. Mm -hmm. And they said it was not like coming to a conclusion on their own, it was being shown something. So they, they had the experience of it coming from outside themselves. And I think you said in your book that, that many of them uh, saw this as the beginning of a process. Yes. An ongoing journey, maybe entry uh, through a door into some, some new uh, kind of relationship, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first time we interviewed people, it had been on average 11 years since their experience. Uh, and we did, it, we did a 10 year follow up. Yeah. Uh, and, and what they reported was that the, the experience had continued. It had been the beginning of a journey that, mm -hmm. that continued over time. A number of them had additional experiences of this kind, so additional mystical or quantum change experiences uh, over the course of the years. And they were changed people. Um, I, we had a sense of being privileged to sit with them. I mean, these, these were transformed people in, in many ways. Um, and the transformation continued. I mean, a lot of it happened right at the moment, but it also continued. When people described to us what their values were before the experience and, and right after the experience and then later in their life, right after and later values were, were fairly similar. But the contrast with the values that they had before their experience was almost a complete flip-flop. Things that had been very low priority became very high priority. And things that had been terribly important dropped to the bottom of the, the uh, values hierarchy. So it just turned things upside down. And interestingly, both men and women seemed to move away from sexual stereotypes of being classically feminine or classically masculine right. to be more like each other um, and a, a higher uh, interest in things spiritual was a, was a very common component, not religious necessarily, um, but the spiritual dimension. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you noticed any compartmentalization in their lives. In other words, that perhaps it touched this area, these areas, but there were some that really weren't touched. And I, I, I take Wilson, for example, where, um, you know, uh, wonderful uh, uh, writer, brilliant guy, all, all that good stuff. But there were certain things in his life that he never got a good hold on. You know, he, he recovered from his alcoholism, but there were other addictions that continued to, uh, to plague him. So um, it wasn't like across the board, total become a saint. <laughs> oh, and it, and it, it doesn't make everything all right. And yeah. it doesn't remove adversity from your life. It, it seems to change how you experience your life and, and adversity. Uh -huh. um, and I must say, these people felt 
very safe. They just had a, had a sense of peace and safety about them. And, and some of them now going into um, riskier situations, working in dangerous neighborhoods or, or you know, with, with populations that you might think of as, as risky, but feeling very safe about it. So it's interesting. We, we ask them, what, now tell us what changed. Right. And the almost immediate common answer was everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah. But uh, but certainly there are areas of life that aren't uh, changed or perfected. Um, but the sense was of being a, a different, a new person, a different person, rather um, rather biblical in that sense. Pauline. Now I, I may have misread this, uh, but did you say in the book that there were some who had rather profound experiences and it didn't affect them at all? Or, or was it just those that had the insightful types that it didn't affect? No, no, both both insightful and mystical types. Both of them were, did. Were they were very similar. Yeah. Uh, I, I probably did say that there are people who have mystical experiences and it doesn't change them. And in, in fact, that's probably the norm. Um, but for some reason, these insights or these mystical experiences were a one-way door that uh, changed these folks. So that, that's part of your definition between a quantum change and a psychic change. Is that, is that right? Well, you use different terminology there. We use psychic change usually in the recovery literature. Yeah, it's not a, ter not a term I've used, psychic change. Uh, but, but quantum change is this particular permanent, relatively sudden, highly memorable experience. Uh, my, my editor wanted me to add one more chapter to the book, which is how you too can have a quantum change. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, we, we proposed five different possible explanations or accounts or understandings of what was happening. Yeah. Um, the last one of which was basically God did it. And, and right. that's the one I favor, I must say, that that uh -huh. these things seem to come from outside us uh, and were acted upon. Uh, it's not the only possible way to think about what's what's happening, but it's my understanding of what's happening. And right. I don't know how to do that. Desperation is helpful, but not determinative. And not necessary. And not necessary. It doesn't have to be. No, again, that, I'm about 40% or so of the people were just going about their lives. Mm -hmm. And that is, the, that is the Scrooge story. He's just going home from work on an ordinary day. Mm -hmm. And bam, this happens to him out of, out of the blue, like a lightning bolt. Uh -huh. And we had people that definitely had that experience and, and didn't understand why it, it happened to them. They were grateful for it. Right. Uh, they had a, a why me experience, not in the poor me, why me, yeah. But in the sense of why was I blessed in this way, or, or of all the people who were suffering in the way I had been, why was I so fortunate to have this experience? Yeah, yeah. One of the quotes I, I uh, took from your biography, I really liked it. You said you described yourself as that you've been living in the doorway mm. between religion and psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's that, what's that been like for you over the years? Yeah, well, in, in graduate school, I was told in no certain, un, no uncertain terms to keep quiet about my religion. <laughs> if you, this is almost a direct quote of our director of clinical training. If you have to believe that sort of thing, keep it to yourself. Right. Uh, so in, in that era in psychology, spirituality was kind of taboo. Uh, you, you could ask people about their sex lives, you could talk about their income, their family conflicts, but you never, never talked about their spirituality or religion. And mm -hmm. there, there never was a good reason for that. William James was obviously one, one of the founders of American psychology, very yeah. interested in spiritual experiences, and his most famous book is on that topic. But somewhere around the 30s, 40s, 50s, psychology got very nervous about spirituality. Uh, and, you know, that's not proper scientific material or you shouldn't be talking about that. Never with a, an explanation. 
And I, I think it has to do with the roots of psychology lying in philosophy and theology. Yes. I mean, we, we came out of that, that root in the 19th century. And like adolescence, I think we had to go through a period of saying, I am not like my parents. I'm not like my parents. I am not like my parents. And then toward the end of the 20th century, psychology kind of came around to saying, you know, maybe my parents knew something. You know, so, uh -huh. uh, and the American Psychological Association began publishing books on spirituality and religion. And the field just kind of opened up. But I, I was much earlier than, than that uh, in my own training and early career. And I did have that experience of I'm learning things in psychology that I think will be useful to pastors. So my wife and I wrote a book for pastors on, on things they might be able to use in counseling. And then also therapists, here are some things you might wanna know about religion because a very substantial proportion of the people that you're treating have religion as a significant part of their lives and it's not something to be uh, overlooked or ignored and it's an important source of, of strength and coping. So and, and, I, it was that passing back and forth. And all of them are spiritual. Well, of course. Whether yeah. religious or not. And so how, how, do, you, how do you blend those two? Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I don't, spirituality is not something you have or don't have. I mean, it's, it, it's like personality. I mean, there are lots of dimensions to it. Right. But it, it's yeah. a part of human nature. Yeah, and AA has in, in, in some ways been a bridge, a bit of a bridge. Uh, between those two worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of, I've been in it um, uh, since 72, and uh, I find that there are movements and things that happen within the recovery world that then happen uh, within the more academic world, the uh, clinical world. It's like we test it out a little bit. Uh, some of the family systems work, I think was really done, a lot of it was done in, in the treatment field, uh, or at least it made it popular, you mm -hmm. know? And the uh, spirituality versus religion, maybe it had some of its uh, major origins in, in AA, separating those two. Yeah, uh, that separation didn't, wouldn't have made, that separation <laughs> would not have made sense to William James. That's right. When he's talking about varieties of religious experience, he's talking about spirituality. Uh, but we, we've come to the place of separating at least institutional religion from the, the spiritual dimension of human beings. Right. Uh, my, my understanding, I could be wrong on this, was that spirituality was a word used much later in the vocabulary. When they were saying religion, like James, that it was understood that's what we're talking about. Yes, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what have you uh, any any thoughts? Uh, I, I know you're not in recovery yourself, but uh, regarding AA's future, because I know you've studied uh, the field quite quite extensively. There's some of us who worry about AA become and, and many 12-step programs becoming well, kind of like what the church did. You know, they become mechanical. They they mm -hmm. have a tendency towards fundamentalism. And, and you lose that transformational element uh, quality too. So we, we replace meetings with, you know, instead of meditation. You understand what I'm getting at? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and you're right, the church did that too. Yeah. So you, yeah. You, you don't hear a lot about spirituality necessarily right. when you go to church, you, you hear dogma or, uh, right. or self help or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, that, you know, I think that that's probably a risk, but I kind of think A is going to hang around for a very long time. Yeah, I'm not it, worried about that. But, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. I, I think there were two influences on AA that I think were not helpful. Uh, one was mandating people to go to AA meetings yes. uh, as, a, as a legal requirement, and AA was never meant to be coerced. Uh, it's attraction, as you know. Uh, and the other was the treatment industry uh, okay. and uh, calling, calling itself 12-step treatment or disease model treatment and doing things that I think are anathema to original Bill W. writings, at least. And that article I sent you that I wrote with Ernie Kurtz was trying to separate original AA from what it became in the treatment industry. 
Uh, yeah, I so go a little crazy when I read studies where they're comparing cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, to AA. Well, AA is not a therapy. No, it's not. It's unfair. No. You can compare it to 12-step facilitation therapy, which we did. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the 12-step facilitation therapy performed at least as well as mm -hmm. motivational interviewing or cognitive behavior therapy. So it's, it's now accepted as an evidence-based treatment, but that's not AA itself. That's a form of, of treatment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're hopeful about the future. I'm a pathological optimist. <laughs> With no intention of recovering from that, eh? <laughs> no, no, no desire to recover from that. Yeah, that's, that's, it's a choice, you know? That's right. Half, glass half full or half empty, you get to choose. Uh, yeah, uh, but ha having, having uh, spent so much time in the addiction field, uh, do, you, do you think we have something to teach uh, science and academia? Uh, is, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, Sam Shoemaker wrote a, a, a great article on what the church has to teach AA. Uh, if I live long enough, no, excuse me, what, what AA has to teach the church, excuse me. Yes, <laughs> both ways. Both. AA has to teach the church. I want to write one on the other end of things. Does the church have something to teach AA? Well, that's passing back and forth. Sure. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think addiction is a wonderful model for sin. Uh, we're, we get antsy about the concept of, of sin, but it biblically just means missing the target or you know, not, not going down the right path. But it, addiction research is such a clear example of how you can get captured. Uh, right. Doing something self-destructive and destructive to others and have difficulty letting go of it. And yes. that's biblical concept of sin. Yeah. That's right. And I'm separated. I'm alienated over here. Yes, yes. It's and about locked, separation. Yes, and locked in with my, whatever the substance or behavior might be. Yeah. But it doesn't work after a while. Well, and, and substance dependence, at least from spiritual eyes, yeah. is putting something in God's place and get giving something a central importance that really belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets like that in, uh, in advanced stages. Right. You sacrifice your relationships and your work and everything. To, uh, your soul. Your soul. Your soul. It's yes. really what, what we're here to do. And that's yeah. the root of psychology, because suke, the Greek, is the soul. I said in the 20th century, psychology lost its soul and then lost its mind. You know? <laughs> And we got the mind back now pretty well with consciousness research, and, and we're getting back in touch with the soul. Well, listen, I, I, I really want to thank you uh, for your book. We, we've gone through it uh, fairly extensively over the course of the last several episodes, and it's been uh, a tremendous help uh, kind of comparing and contrasting it uh, with William James and, uh, and then uh, what the impact is on... Um, on our own spiritual lives and development as we participate in 12-step uh, programs. So um, I, want to, I want to thank you once again for, for coming by and, and joining us and uh, for the great work that you have done throughout your life in the addiction treatment field. Uh, many, many, many uh, thanks for all of that on behalf of millions. <laughs> thanks very much and, and glad to meet you. Well, great to meet you. Uh, I saw when, when you were just starting your, uh, your academic work, I was just starting my recovery work. That's right. Yeah, about the same time. Yeah, 70, 72, yeah, 71. And, um, uh, so anyway, uh, thank you very much. Um, I want, want to just say a final word to our uh, listeners. If you haven't done so, I encourage you to go to our website, listen to Two Way Prayer, put your ego aside for a, a moment and uh, allow it to listen to for God's voice uh, in your mind. You've got an addict voice, you've got a critic voice. I think you might be surprised to find out that there's another voice in there if you'll, if you'll only listen to it. And it's really wiser than the ego and uh, good for the ego to take uh, the back seat for a while. So again, uh, Professor Miller, thank you so much for coming by and uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, God bless and keep coming back.